The 8,622nd meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in the Middle East. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite Ms Ursula Muller, Assistant Secretary-General for Humanitarian Affairs and Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator, to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of Item 2 of the agenda. I now give the floor to Ms Ursula Muller. Mr President, distinguished Council members, there have been several notable developments uh, in Syria since the Under Secretary General briefed you three weeks ago about the humanitarian situation. And I wanted to start today with an update about Northwest Syria. On 30th of August, the Russian Federation announced a unilateral ceasefire in the Idlib de-escalation area, which the government of Syria later confirmed. Reports indicate a decline in fighting compared to the period since late April, when the military escalation began. It is critical that the much-needed respite for civilians continues, unimpeded humanitarian access be facilitated to all civilians in need, and the protected status of civilian infrastructure be respected. Worrying signs of insecurity are, however, present. Ground forces have continued to exchange shelling in southern Idlib and eastern Latakia and airstrikes were reported in central and northern Idlib over the past week. At the same time, the listed terrorist group Hayat Tahrir al-Sham and other non-state armed groups continue to harass, intimidate and coerce civilians, including medical workers. The humanitarian situation, Mr. President, remains alarming. An estimated 400,000 people fled their homes in northwest Syria from May to August. Many of these people have been displaced multiple times, both prior to and during the current military escalation. These displacements follow familiar patterns, with civilians largely moving northward, away from conflict-affected areas, to already densely populated areas in northern Idlib. In addition to the needs of those displaced, host communities are becoming increasingly strained, leading to additional demands on overstretched humanitarian assistance. Needs in these areas are considerable across all sectors, food and non-food, water and sanitation, health, education and protection. The shelter situation is of particular concern Increased demand and short supply mean many families are unable to afford rents in urban areas. A survey earlier this month found that about 600,000 people live in tents, camps and sites for internally displaced persons. Humanitarian partners report that in the absence of viable alternatives, families in some areas resort to living out in the open. Following months of intensive fighting, the outlook in northwest Syria remains uncertain. We know, though, that winter is coming. Humanitarian organizations are already planning how to help people in need before temperatures drop and inclement weather arrives. Humanitarians estimate that an additional $68.4 million is required to address expected winterization, shelter and non-food item needs. Continued donor support is essential to maintain the current humanitarian response, but also to scale up operations to meet the expected needs across northwest Syria in the months ahead. Mr. President, 
Humanitarian efforts to assist civilians in need across northwest Syria depend on more than just financial support. As the Under Secretary General stressed last month, the people in Idlib are reached exclusively through the cross border operation. On a monthly basis, more than 1.6 million people in need receive some form of assistance. The renewal of your resolution 2165 later this year is crucial to sustain the ongoing support to millions of people in need and to respond to further needs in the months ahead. As you are aware, on September 13th, the Secretary General announced the establishment of an internal independent United Nations Headquarters Board of Inquiry to investigate a series of incidents that have occurred in northwest Syria. The board will commence its work on September 30th to ascertain the facts of specific incidents of concern and to report to the Secretary General about its conclusions. We stand ready to support the board in its inquiry. Mr. President, I have some developments to report about another intractable humanitarian situation in the Rukban area. On September 11, a team comprised of 20 UN staff and 170 staff and volunteers from the Syrian Arab Red Crescent completed a six-day mission to Rukban, delivering food and nutrition assistance for approximately 15,000 internally displaced persons. This joint mission was the second UN SARC convoy in 2019 to reach the remote area with humanitarian assistance. This mission was not without difficulties. Access to people in the area depended on extensive coordination with community leaders, armed groups, and multiple member states, including the Syrian Arab Republic, the Russian Federation, the United States, and Jordan. Tensions on the ground were high. Moreover, the teams found that conditions have gradually deteriorated in the past months, with reports that several children have died of preventable causes. The work to support people in Rukban is not over. UN SARC teams are preparing for the next phase of their plan, which is to assist up to 6,000 people that expressed a wish to depart Rukban for areas under government control. Such an operation depends on the continued cooperation of all parties to facilitate the UN SARC teams in supporting the voluntary departure of civilians from Rukban in a safe, well-informed and dignified manner. Relevant parties will also need to take further efforts to find solutions for the population staying in Rukban in consultation with them. And on a related note, I welcome the arrival of Mr. Imran Riza, the new UN resident coordinator and humanitarian coordinator for Syria, who presented his credentials to the Syrian government on Monday. Mr. President, we have frequently reported to the Council about the desperate situation in Al Hol camp. As of early September, some 68,600 individuals reside in the camp, 94% of whom are women and children. Humanitarian organizations continue to seek ways to improve camp facilities, particularly in the water and sanitation conditions and availability of health care. Their efforts have contributed to a decrease in reported illnesses in recent weeks. Negotiations continue with camp administrators to ensure sustained humanitarian access to civilians in need, particularly in the camp's annex, where third country nationals are accommodated. If agreed, humanitarian organizations are prepared to provide around-the-clock health services, which currently are restricted to daylight hours. Despite these efforts, the situation in Al Hol remains extremely challenging and seemingly without an imminent solution. Children comprise two-thirds of the camp population. Many of them have been exposed to extreme violence and trauma under ISIL. Insecurity and violence continue to be reported inside the camp. 
Many households face uncertainties about their future and remain concerned about the fate of missing male family members. In this regard, solutions for foreign nationals need to be urgently found so as not to prolong their conditions. We call yet again on all member states to take the measures necessary to ensure that their nationals are repatriated for rehabilitation and reintegration or prosecution as appropriate in line with international law and standards. Failure to do so now can place children at risk of future radicalization, which will only make future action more difficult. Still in northeast Syria, in Darezor Governorate, humanitarian actors are increasingly concerned about new access challenges. On September the 13th, the Syrian Democratic Forces reportedly closed all crossing points to areas under the government of Syria until further notice, forcing civilians to resort to more dangerous informal crossings and interfering in humanitarian operations. Unimpeded humanitarian access remains essential to ensure the estimated 1.2 million people in need across northeast Syria have access to essential services and assistance. Mr. President, I would like to take a step back from these urgent humanitarian situations which we brief you about on a routine basis to highlight two cross-cutting dynamics affecting civilians across Syria. The first is food insecurity. Earlier this month, the World Food Program and the Food and Agriculture Organization reported greater harvests in Syria compared to last year. Wheat production, for instance, is estimated at 2.2 million tons, up from 1.2 million in 2018. Even if the overall production remains a fraction of pre-crisis levels, an improved agricultural outlook is hopeful news. At the same time, families in Syria face even greater challenges in making ends meet. Food prices have gradually increased nationwide over the last 12 to 14 months, just as the value of their currency has gone down. Importantly, we know the most vulnerable families are the least able to cope with such pressures. Such conditions only heighten, heighten the importance of ongoing efforts to support the more than 6.5 million people estimated to need food and livelihood support. On a monthly basis, humanitarian organizations deliver food assistance to 4.4 million people in need. It is important to stress that this assistance is provided based on assessed needs. Almost 75% of this food assistance reaches districts identified with the most severe needs. Mr. President, the second dynamic that I would like to highlight is the threat posed by unexploded ordnance. Civilians in Syria face a chronic danger even in areas where fighting has subsided. More than 10 million people in Syria are estimated to live in contaminated areas. Indeed, incidents have been recorded across Syria since the end of August. On September 8, in Darezor, an unexploded ordnance reportedly killed a man while he was checking his house in Abu Kamal district. Days earlier, in northern rural Aleppo, two separate landmine explosions reportedly caused multiple casualties. And on September 1, a landmine reportedly injured 11 people, including five women and three children, in western rural Dara governorate. The indiscriminate nature of unexploded ordnance makes them a shared challenge. I support standing calls for all parties to the conflict to allow clearance of unexploded ordnance to safely conduct risk education efforts, and to ensure that respect and safety for humanitarian staff conducting the clearance activities. Mr. President, I want to return to Northwest Syria to conclude my briefing. In recent weeks, 
the fragile ceasefire has brought into focus an outlook that for this Security Council should be all too familiar. Further fighting will endanger and displace thousands of civilians. Further displacement will create even more needs. Further needs will stretch humanitarians that are already at their limit. The world is watching, Mr. President, in hopes that a more humane outlook for Syria will be created. One where civilians are safe, needs are addressed, and humanitarians are protected. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Ms. Muller for her briefing. I now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of Germany. Thank you, Mr. President, and um, my statement uh, will be issued on behalf of the co-pen holders, that is um, Belgium, Kuwait, and, and Germany. At the outset, um, let me thank Secretary General Müller, Assistant Secretary General Müller for her comprehensive briefing on the humanitarian situation in Syria. We once again reiterate our appreciation for all the efforts of humanitarian and medical personnel to alleviate human suffering in Syria. Once again, we heard from OCHA about the dire situation in northwestern Syria and the fragility of the unilateral ceasefire. The number of people in need of humanitarian assistance are staggering. There are almost three million people in Idlib. The vast majority of them are women and children. Over half a million people have fled the violence over the past few months, some of them having to flee more than once. Over 1,000 civilians have been killed. Hospitals, schools, and IDP locations have been targeted and destroyed by bombardments. If this situation does not move the Council to take action, what will? That is why today we will be voting on a draft resolution proposed by the Syrian humanitarian co-pen holders, Kuwait, Belgium, and Germany. We have been negotiating this text in an inclusive, transparent, and thorough manner for the past few weeks with all Council members. The aim of the text is purely humanitarian. It intends to protect the civilian population of Idlib from the ongoing offensive. It also emphasizes that counterterrorism operations must be in compliance with international humanitarian law, respect <coughs> the principles of distinction, proportionality, and precaution, and have to distinguish between the civilian population and combatants. Civilians must never be the victims of a fight against terrorism. We hope that our resolution will gain the support of the entire Council, especially as its objective is a purely humanitarian one. The Council must speak up in a united manner to address the immense human suffering faced by the civilian population of Idlib. We call for the Council to urgently take a unified stance in support of our humanitarian resolution. We are also extremely concerned by the situation in other areas of Syria, um, which was also highlighted by the ASG. In the south, 2.8 million people require humanitarian assistance. In Rukban, we continue to call for a sustainable solution for the thousands of people there. In Al Hol camp, where over 70,000 still receive humanitarian assistance, the situation remains deeply concerning, especially as women and children form over 90% of the camp's population. They are highly vulnerable and need specific protection. Mr. President, we welcome the composition and the start of work of the Board of Inquiry. It is important to accomplish a quick and thorough investigation of the incidents that took place, in particular the attacks on facilities communicated under the deconfliction mechanism. The cross-border mechanism renewed under Resolution 2449 remains a critical lifeline for millions of Syrians, particularly in the Northwest. The UN has repeatedly stated that there is no other way to provide support for these civilians. The continuation of this mechanism is essential to alleviating hum human suffering, as also was indicated by the ASG this morning. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Germany for his statement, and I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Assistant Secretary General. 
Thank you for your sobering but necessary update on the humanitarian crisis in Syria. First, let me commend the organizations and the individuals providing life-saving assistance to millions of Syrians. Their work is heroic, and the United States proudly supports them. At the same time, I regret the fact that this Council is yet again hearing reports of medical facilities being targeted by the Assad regime and its allies, civilians being killed, and humanitarians being denied access to desperate populations. Business as usual cannot continue to define these monthly sessions. This Council must hold the regime and its allies accountable for the atrocities it has committed, and we must ensure access for humanitarian wherever aid is needed in Syria. As we have heard the toll in Idlib these past four months has been gruesome. More than 1,000 people killed, including at least 304 children, 164 women, and 30 humanitarian workers, roughly 2,000 wounded. Nearly all of the 1,089 civilians killed between April and August were attributed to Syrian regime forces and their allies, according to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet. The Assad regime unilaterally announced a ceasefire on August 30th, but this so-called ceasefire, like others before it, merely offered cover for the regime to regroup, reorganize, and rest before its next attack. The regime's despicable, if familiar, practice of launching attacks that damage health care facilities has likewise resumed. On September 13th, a regime artillery strike hit the Kiwan Hospital in Idlib. This marks the 52nd medical facility struck in the past five months. In the short term, these effects are horrific, but the lasting effects are catastrophic and will persist for generations. Meanwhile, in Sufuhan, a white helmet center was destroyed on September 12th. We welcome the Secretary General's decision to establish a board of inquiry to investigate attacks that damaged humanitarian facilities in northwest Syria and that the UN has identified the board's members to manage this important accountability effort. We stand ready to support the board's work and encourage all member states to do the same. Additionally, we call for the Secretary General to make the board's final report public. The intentional targeting of civilians and civilian objects is a violation of international humanitarian law, especially when these persons and objects reside in formally deconflicted zones. Issuing a public report will greatly aid in holding responsible parties to account. The Assad regime in Russia must cease bombardments that would wound and kill civilians and devastate civilian infrastructure. As the United States has reiterated time and time again, there is no military solution to this conflict. With respect to the Rukban settlement, we recommend, we commend the UN and its partners for completing their assessment mission and delivering critical supplies to nearly 15,000 displaced Syrians. We urge the Assad regime and Russia to allow sustained deliveries of humanitarian assistance to Rukban from Damascus and to keep commercial routes to the encampment open as long as the civilians choose to remain in the settlement. The return of internally displaced persons and refugees in Syria must be informed, safe, voluntary, and dignified. We strongly urge all parties to work with the UN to ensure that proposals for return align with the UN guiding principles on internal displacement and that the displaced persons receive all relevant information so that they may make informed decisions about their movement and safety. We remained alarmed by reports that the Assad regime has detained thousands of returning Syrians and continues to arrest and torture civilians, including those who signed reconciliation agreements with the regime. We call for an end to the Assad regime's cruel detention practices. We welcome the efforts by the members of this body to stop the humanitarian catastrophic unfold in Idlib. To meet this goal, we strongly support the resolution drafted by Kuwait, Belgium, and Germany, which includes a meaningful ceasefire to the ongoing hostilities in Idlib and will protect civilians and provide needed accountability measures. 
all council members should support this draft. Finally, efforts by other members of the council to promote a separate resolution that denies the people of Syria a full ceasefire will not bring halt to the suffering of Syrians and should not receive support from any members of this council. I would certainly like to believe that all of you will join me in standing with the people of Syria by supporting the sole resolution that will bring an end to the ongoing regime strikes. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United States for her statement and I give the floor to the representative of France. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I should like to begin by thanking Ms. Ursula Muller for her briefing. I would also once again like to hail the remarkable commitment of all of the humanitarian personnel in Syria. More than ever, we should concentrate our efforts on three areas. The firstly, that is the implementation of the ceasefire in Idlib. This should be an absolute priority. We are very concerned by the resumption of airstrikes last week following the announcement of a unilateral ceasefire on the 31st of August. We continue to follow the developments in the situation on the ground carefully and we call for the strict implementation of the Sochi Memorandum a year after its signature between Turkey and Russia. Everything must be done to ensure an effective ceasefire in the northwest to freeze the fronts and also to have a ceasefire at national level pursuant to resolution 2254. In this regard we support the draft resolution presented by the pen holders Belgium and Kuwait. The second thing I want to concentrate on is respect for international humanitarian law by all and which is non-negotiable. Here I should like to recall two requirements and two priorities. Firstly, the protection of civilians, including humanitarian and medical personnel. The fight against terrorism is essential. Nobody contests that, but it cannot be used to justify violations of international humanitarian law. This is why we welcome the launching of an internal inquiry by the UN Secretary General on the attacks on de-conflicted infrastructure in the northwest of the country, and we reiterate to him our full support. I repeat, the fight against terrorism can never justify the sacrifice of civilian lives, in particular children. It cannot justify indiscriminate bombing or the deliberate destruction of hospitals or schools. The crimes committed in Idlib, as with the rest of Syria, cannot and should not remain unpunished. Those who are guilty of these crimes will one day have to account for themselves before justice. The second requirement is that we guarantee immediate, safe, complete, sustainable and unimpeded humanitarian access across Syrian territory for the benefit of the populations that have the greatest need of such access. In order to do this, violence must cease immediately in Idlib. We once again call on those who have the means to do so to exercise the necessary pressure on the regime so that they guarantee humanitarian access that is unimpeded across Syria and in particular in the zones under their control, including the territory that has been conquered since 2018 in the southwest and also in eastern Gotha, as well as the Rukban camp. Guaranteeing humanitarian access, and this is an essential point, also entails that the United Nations has access to displaced persons and refugees who are returning home. Thirdly, the situation in Idlib is urgent and it reminds us that only an inclusive political solution can pacify and stabilise the country over the long term and allow refugees to return to their countries. We reiterate our full support for the efforts of the Special Envoy Gare Peterson in attempting to finalise a balanced agreement on the Constitutional Committee, both in terms of its composition and its rule of procedure. We take good note of the most recent encouraging developments provided by the Secretary General and we call for the United Nations to launch a constitutional committee as soon as possible in Geneva. 
we have to end procrastination here. It is important that in parallel the Special Envoy work on the basis of all of the elements of Resolution 2254, in particular in preparing elections and confidence building measures. We hope that the high level week of the General Assembly will represent an opportunity to increase mobilisation to support the political process. In the absence of such progress, and without the prospect of a political settlement, France and the European Union will not be able to finance the, participate in the financing of reconstruction. This would then fall to the regime and its allies. We call on each member of the Security Council to take ownership of its responsibilities to end the tragedy that continues before our very eyes in Idlib. And we invite the members of the Council to vote in favour of the text presented by the humanitarian co-sponsors, Germany, Belgium and Kuwait. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the representative of France and I give the floor to the representative of China. Mr President, I thank Assistant Secretary General Mueller for her briefing. The relevant parties of the international community have recently made active diplomatic efforts to improve the situation in Idlib. Starting from the 31st of August, Russia and the Syrian government have implemented in the Idlib a ceasefire which has generally held. On the 16th of September, the presidents of Russia, Turkey and Iran met in Ankara and agreed to take measures to ease the tension in Idlib stressing that no party is allowed to violate Syria's sovereignty, independence, unity and territorial integrity, and reiterating the intention to carry out cooperation against terrorism and take concrete measures to protect civilians. China welcomes these developments and supports Russia, Turkey and Iran in seeking in the interests of the Syrian nation and people a comprehensive solution to fight terrorism and address the humanitarian issues in Idlib. We expect the Astana process to continue its important role. China has been following closely the humanitarian situation in Syria as it cares about the interests and well-being of the Syrian people. Years of conflict have resulted in a huge demand for humanitarian aid in Syria, and the economic sanctions have worsened the living conditions of the Syrian people. The international community must take into account both the current food and other living conditions of the Syrian people and issues relating to the country's post-war reconstruction, national security and development. We should also properly tackle the issue of foreign terrorist fighters and their families and the return of refugees and IDPs to their homes. The international community has a moral responsibility to help the Syrian people shake off the shadows of war and lead a peaceful, stable and promising life. In carrying out humanitarian relief operations in Syria, the United Nations and its relevant agencies should fully respect Syria's sovereignty, independence, unity and territorial integrity, strictly abide by the Security Council resolutions, UN guiding principles on humanitarian assistance and relevant provisions of international law. They should step up communication and coordination with the Syrian government. There is a lot of controversy over the Secretariat's move to establish a board of inquiry into incidents in northwestern Syria. China is concerned about the implications this move may have on Syria's political process. At present, the Syrian government is actively promoting development and improving people's livelihood. China appreciates these efforts. China is in communication and coordination with the Syrian government and plans to focus on launching livelihood-related projects to support Syria in its post-war reconstruction. Mr. President, a political solution to the Syrian problem is a fundamental way to ease the humanitarian situation in Syria. For some time now, the Secretary General's Special Envoy for Syria, Yair Peterson, has been actively engaged in good offices to promote the political process based on the principle of a Syria led and owned by the Syrians and on Security Council Resolution 2254, with the political settlement of the Syrian issue now showing an upward momentum. China supports the Special Envoy's efforts and calls upon all parties in Syria to resolve their differences through dialogue and consultation. Members of the Council should also remain united in providing political support for the Special Envoy's efforts to form a constitutional committee. 
I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of China and give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr. President. The situation for civilians in northwest Syria is devastating. Over 1,000 civilians have been killed, including over 500 women and children, and almost 630,000 people have been forced to leave their homes since the beginning of May. I'd like to thank ASG Muller for her briefing and for the work which her uh, officials and colleagues are doing. And we commend your work and we commend the work of humanitarian agencies to address the humanitarian suffering of the people in Idlib. The United Kingdom has contributed over $150 million for humanitarian assistance in Idlib over the past 18 months. And I took careful note of what Assistant Secretary General Muller had to say about the importance of the cross-border resolution uh, in that context. Uh, we, of course, support uh, that resolution. Colleagues, the Security Council must act to protect civilians in Idlib. That is why we fully support the humanitarian penholders, Belgium, Kuwait and Germany, on their proposed resolution. We will be voting in favour, in favour of protecting civilians, in favour of ending indiscriminate attacks. This council has a duty to protect those suffering on the ground. We need to send a message to the regime that the international community is resolute in condemning their actions and will not let them to continue unabated. Only a vote in favour of the co penholders resolution will send the message that countries around this table representing the international community will not accept the wanton targeting of civilians and civilian infrastructure, regardless of the stated objective. Now is not a time to sit on the fence. Mr. President, we know the Syrian regime do not care how many of its civilians they kill, but Russia says it does. And if so, they should vote in favor of the co penholders text, and they and China should withdraw their text which would permit continued attacks on civilians. We note Russian claims to the press recently that Ocha's information is not up to date, apparently, given their lack of presence on the ground. This only reinforces the need for Russia to press the Syrian authorities to approve Ocha's request for greater humanitarian access on the ground. Mr. President, on Monday, the Astana guarantors noted their commitment to sustainable peace in Syria, and that this can only be achieved through political and diplomatic methods. We have been waiting a very long time for political progress. We ask again for Russia to maintain pressure on the regime to fully engage with the political process, and of course to end the violence in Idlib, which threatens uh, that political process. Finally, Mr. President, we welcome the Secretary General's Board of Inquiry which will soon begin to investigate some of the recent appalling attacks in Idlib. We call for the findings of this inquiry to be released to the public. Now, some of the information underlying those founding findings may need to remain confidential, but it is crucial that this board is transparent in its mandate and output. The international community, but more importantly, the Syrian people, deserve to be privy to its findings on events in Idlib. Mr. President, ASG Muller said the world was watching this council. But the Syrian people, men, women and children, are dying while they watch. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I would like to congratulate you and congratulate the friendly delegation of your country on assuming the presidency of the Security Council this month, and I express our deepest appreciation to the positions of your country underpinned by the principles of international law and the provisions of the Charter. Mr. President,
an Arab philosopher who is well known. His name is Mutanabbi. This philosopher who lived 1,000 years ago in Baghdad and in Damascus, in Aleppo as well, said something that is very valid until this moment. He said, and I quote, if, if someone does something wrong, then he has misconceptions. Unquote. I'm going to explain why this saying is still valid. The governments of some permanent members of this council who are supposed to be entrusted with upholding the principles of our charter and maintaining international peace and security, they continue to misuse the mechanisms of this international organization, including this important house, to politicize the humanitarian situation in Syria, my country. They use it also as a tool in a hostile campaign to undermine the security and stability of my country and support terrorism and to level accusations to tarnish the image of the Syrian government and its allies and to cover up the crimes of these countries, these same countries and the crimes of their allies, proxies and tools in the region. Many realize that some parties have betted with money, effort, weapons, and diplomacy in the market of Syrian blood, in the terrorist Wall Street, in the caves of Idlib. I'm, ple I'm pleased to tell those investors that their bets are, are not going to win and they will only bring them defeat. They will leave our territory in Idlib, Mr. President. The, state, the truth that is absent in the statements of countries that adopt hostile positions against Syria in the Council and in the briefings of OCHA, the truth that is absent is that improving the humanitarian situation in Syria and addressing the challenges the Syrians are facing to secure their basic living needs requires the following. First, to fully respect the sovereignty of the Syrian Arab Republic, its unity and territorial integrity. And this is the substantive principle underscored by the Security Council in more than 20 resolutions adopted over the past eight years on the situation in my country at the humanitarian and political levels. Second, to support the efforts of the Syrian government and its allies in combating the remnants of armed terrorist organizations and FTFs, to implement the resolutions of this council, resolutions on counterterrorism. There are 12 resolutions. Third, end the legal existence of foreign, foreign troops on the Syrian Arab Republic territories and to end war crimes and crimes against humanity perpetrated by the illegal global coalition. Four, cooperate with the Syrian government as a key partner at the humanitarian development levels away from any political preconditions or diktats that are rejected or attempts of extortion to undermine the efforts of reconstruction and the return of IDPs. Five, end unilateral coercive measures that have significantly affected the lives of Syrians and impeded their access to their basic daily needs. Mr. President, honorable colleagues, the Syrian government spares no effort to lend support and secure basic needs to all its citizens, where are, wherever they are, on Syrian territories. The government also supports and facilitates the efforts of the United Nations and its humanitarian partners in accordance with the guidelines included in uh, the General Assembly Resolution uh, 46-182. I recall that the Syrian government accepted the ceasefire in the de-escalation zone in Idlib 
on the 31st of August, while reserving the right to reply to any violation by terrorists. And my government coordinated with the friendly Russian side to open a second humanitarian corridor in Abu Dhur in Idlib, in, a, in addition to the first humanitarian crossing that was previously opened in the city of Suran to enable civ civilians to leave the areas where terrorist uh, army terrorist groups exist. These terrorist groups take them as human shields to allow those to go to areas liberated from terrors by the Syrian Arab army and its allies. But terrorist groups for the seventh, seventh day in a row target civilians, shoot them to prevent them leave through those crossings. Syrian-Russian coordination culminated in the extraction of 29,000 civilians from who were held in the Rukban camp and securing temporary shelters to receive them. And the Syrian government has recently facilitated a, an assessment mission by the United Nations and the Syrian Red Crescent, as well as an assistant convoy to the camp in the occupied Tanf area, occupied by the U.S. troops and the uh, Magawir Athawra group the revolution commanders. The United Nations, also uh, following this visit, uh, announced that 13,000 people are in the camp and 37% of them wish to leave and to return to the areas controlled by the government. But the occupying U.S. troops didn't allow them to do, the, to do so and seized the assistance and transferred such assistance to the area of Tanf. The Syrian government continues to cooperation with humanitarian partners to address the situation in the camp of Hole, and the ICRC approved uh, a mobile field hospital to enter the camp with a hundred people of technicians and, pers and medical personnel, in addition to rendering assistance to the, those in need in the camp and in the surrounding areas. When we score the responsibility of countries concerned to withdraw their terrorists and their families from the camp without delay, these points are a few examples that demonstrate the significant efforts by Syria at the humanitarian level. These are not questionable. And this also testifies to the result of international cooperation when there is good intentions and willingness. I reiterate my thanks to the Russian Federation for its efforts to this end. I recall that had it not been for the support rendered by the Syrian government to the work of the United Nations and, and other partners in humanitarian action, the United Nations wouldn't have been able to make the achievements noted in the reports. Mr. President, in the past few weeks, humanitarian penholders have drawn up a draft resolution on my country. It's a draft resolution that has nothing to do with its announced objectives. We reject it categorically for many reasons, including, one, there was no consultation and sincere coordination with the key party concerned, the Syrian Arab Republic. Two, the draft resolution ignores the root causes of the crisis, which is terrorism that is globally supported and the illegal existence of foreign troops on territories of my country and their practices to impose a new fait accompli that runs counter to the uh, assertions of, of your resolutions regarding uh, commitment to the sovereignty of the Syrian Arab Republic, its territorial integrity and unity. Three, the draft resolution ignores the need for excluding terrorist groups from cessation of hostilities in a manner that contravenes the Sochi and Astana agreements. It also ignores the responsibility of member states for returning terrorists and their uh, families, as well as holding them accountable not to have indifference or shirk their responsibilities. They should revoke uh, citizenship from those terrorists. So as or oh, oh, they revoke their citizenship in order for them to stay in Syria at the expense of the Syrian people. 
the countries that sub submitted the draft resolution were hasting in being belligerent against the Syrian Arab Republic and to engage in efforts to undermine the security and stability of the region to serve the interests of Israel. Uh, they have joined the illegal global coalition. They have stained their history of relation with the Syrian people. They have practiced economic uh, terrorism against Syria through imposing unilateral coercive measures. I advise those who have illusions, who think they can turn Tanf into an occupied pocket such as Guantanamo or to turn Idlib to another Tora Boro. They should stop these illusions. Therefore, Mr. President, my delegation invites you to vote against the draft resolution submitted by the humanitarian penholders. I thank you. I thank the representative of the Syrian Arab Republic for his statement. There are no more speakers on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned.